Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So, uh, well, it's very nice to be here. I'm very honored and moved by all this. And, uh, well, I certainly wish uh, Eliezer and Shimon uh, many, many happy returns. And uh, uh, I apologize for inflicting for you one more talk on this long day. Uh, the advantage of having PowerPoint is that you can make n versions of the same talk, go to large n, and, uh, <laughs> and you click on, on this. So uh, actually, when I saw this picture, I thought it was going back to the time. I thought the background was the part of the scene of the Weizmann incident. No way, no way. I was explained. So because the first time I met Eliezer and Shimon was when I came back from the States as a professor to Weizmann Institute, and they were two uh, of my excellent students in the class. So now this was when you were even younger, right? I understand. So, uh, well, so the advantage is that the talk consists of two disconnected parts so you can... Uh, Just one comment, Gabriel. Yes. Your affiliation, you should explain that CDF is not the collaboration. That's right. The there is a small d. There is a small d. It's Collège de France. Sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, so yeah, there are two disconnected parts of this talk, so you can choose which one you want to sleep during. <laughs> um, so uh, the first part is mainly work done in collaboration with Adi Armoni and Misha Schiffman, with uh, also a uh, collaboration by Cam Shore. The second is work done mainly with uh, Dacek Bosiek and also with some input by uh, Enrico Noffi. Um, uh, let me say this will be very elementary uh, by the standards of today's string theory, uh, we really go back to some very old large N ideas and then try to perhaps improve on them in a rather uh, amusing way, I hope. So let me remind you of something that you all know very well. The large N expansion of QCD started in 1974 with a work by Gerhard Hoff. That was an expansion in which you take the number of colors large, you keep fixed the number uh, of flavors as well as the product of the uh, gauge coupling times uh, MC. And uh, the nice thing is that the leading diagrams for large N consist of planar diagrams without quark loops, just gluon insertions uh, and planar. Now, the leading order approximation gets corrections of order n f over n c from quark loops, in principle, uh, and uh, 1 over n c squared from higher genus diagrams. Now, which are the features of such an approximation? Well, uh, you have the properties that resonances become absolutely stable in that approximation to the zero width limit. Uh, this I took from some. <laughs> this is supposed to be a hefty phase, and this, as you can see, is a sad one. Um, <laughs> so, resonance is having zero with, say, makes us happy because, well, resonances, hadronic resonance, etc., pretty narrow, they lie on almost straight line red trajectories. On the other hand, the U1 problem is not solved. With large N, you still have a ninth ghost of boson. But uh, this is not obviously a shortcoming because the next to leading order you have this formula by Witten and myself, which can be justified as the next to leading order approximation and that works quantitatively quite well. And finally, multiparticle production for the same reason that the resonances do not decay is forbidden. Now, theoretically, it's a very appealing, uh, if not with a very appealing approximation because it should give the three level of some kind of string theory that we are still chasing for. Actually, perhaps a posteriori, it's the validity of the approximate validity of this larger expansion 
the reason why we uh, fell on a string theory of strong interactions in the first place in the late 60s. Uh, now, it proven hard to solve, except, as you know, from the famous work of Toft again, in two dimensions. Then, uh, a, uh, a variant of that expansion is the so-called topological expansion I was more involved with, uh, which within string theory or the dual resonance models at the time was supposed to be a one over n flavor expansion that fixed g string or g dual model square and n. Uh, this was some kind of justification of my humble attempts to do some topological considerations in the years 1970 to 74. Now from a QCD Viewpoints, that's a one over an expansion that fits g square n, where I don't have to specify which n because the ratio of n f over n c is also get fixed. The leading diagrams now include quark loops. These quark loops are empty, there are no gluons inside, I and mean, you cannot put gluons both inside and outside these quark loops. And uh, the corrections now are nicer, if you want, they are only over the one over n square. No. Uh, no NF over no one of these corrections. And again, with this uh, happy and sad faces, now widths are not small, are uh, over the one, so let's call it a negative thing. And uh, the U1 problem is solved now to living order, but then there is no reason to, uh, to believe that this uh, formula, WB formula, is any good. So Again, a happy phase, but with a question mark, maybe. And uh, multi-particle production is allowed. And in fact, this expansion is at the base of some so-called dual particle model in which you start from a bare homeron related to a cylinder-type topology, and then hydrogenous surfaces induce the so-called gribble uh, radio field theory correction. Now, perhaps it's phenomenologically more appealing than the original top expansion, but of course it's even harder to solve. But uh, this is all I have to say about the old fun. Now we start with the new fun. I claim that there is a third possibility, and the third possibility is to generalize QCD to n larger than 3, up to n for infinity, and n from here on will be just the number of colors. In different ways by simply playing with matter representations. Now, uh, the conventional way I have been discussing so far, which we call QCD F, F for fundamental, keeps the quartz in the N plus N bar representation. But there is another possibility, which for many reasons that I will not go into, is called QCD or the antifold. And this is to assign the quartz to the two index antisymmetric representation of S to N plus, of course, it's complex conjugate. As in top expansion, and unlike in the topological expansion, NF is kept fixed. In fact, unless NF is less than 6, uh, uh, asymptotic freedom would be lost at like n because of the higher representation in which we have put our fermions. But, of course, the important thing is that this is still an extrapolation of good old QCD because at n equals 3, it doesn't matter if you put the uh, quarks in the fundamental or in the two index antisymmetric representation because they are the same up to a complex conjugation. Now, what are the features of these expansions? Well, the leading diagrams are planar, but now they include quark loops which are filled up with gluons themselves. Uh, the widths are still zero. So it's an error resonance approximation again. The U1 problem is solved to leading order. There's still no particle production. I don't know whether this is phenomenologically more interesting than the previous one, but the claim is that this uh, larger limit may turn out to be more manageable uh, uh, theoretically. It's, it's quite similar in the sense that it was done for very different purposes, but also Corian and Ramon had proposed this to have the, the quartz uh, in the 
I think they, their idea was to keep the barium uh, to be three, a three quart system. So they said, well, if we put the uh, one, f I think one flavor in the two index antisymmetric representation and the other two in the, uh, in the fundamental, we can have at any end, we can have it. But as you will see, this will be quite an opposite game. We will not try to do anything with the fermions, with the baryons, but uh, just uh, with the boson degrees of freedom. Now, uh, I don't want to go through the details of this table, but this is just some numerology of QCD fundamental versus QCD orientable, whose main aim is to argue that QCD orientable is like an interpolating theory, and this is very easy to understand. Uh, it coincides with pure young mills because antisymmetric fermions decouple at n equal two. If you have only two colors to antisymmetrize two indices, it's like having a singlet. So this theory reduces to young mills if you put n equal two, as you can see, for instance, from the beta functions of an anomalous dimension of some uh, fermion bilinear. Uh, of course, as I said already, at uh, n equal 3, it goes to QCD, and the question is, where does it go at large n? And uh, just to make one case which is most relevant, let me take the large n limit for one flavor, then this beta and gamma functions go to this uh, rather nice forms. Uh, and, uh, well, this is more than numerology. We made with uh, harmonic Schiffman the claim that we call planar equivalence, which can be stated as follows, that at large n, a bosonic sector, which has to be specified, of QCD or the antifold is equivalent to a corresponding sector of another theory, which is QCD adjoint, which means we take QCD with NF Majorana now fermion in the adjoint representation. Now, if this claim is true, and I will argue that it is, then there is an important corollary to this. If we take NF equal 1 and 0 mass, that QCD orientable is plenary equivalent to supersymmetric Young Mills theory, because QCD uh, with, uh, with one single Majorana fermion their joint is nothing but massless a joint is nothing but a supersymmetric <coughs> theory. So the conclusion is that some properties of the latter of supersymmetric Young Mills theory should show up in one flavor QCD, of course provided that n equals 3 is large enough. I uh, maybe didn't say it, but uh, the expected accuracy of this um, correspondence is expected to be only 1 over n, as you can see also from the beta function expressions that I had in the previous slide. On the other hand, 1 over n is not such a uh, terrible uh, expansion parameter if you think that in the top expansion, the uh, expected accuracy is an F over N. So uh, now uh, we gave both perturbative and non perturbative arguments for the, uh, <coughs> for the correspondence, and let me give you a, a little sketch of the non perturbative argument. We said let's integrate out the fermion since they appear bilinearly in the, in the action. Uh, after having included masses and also uh, bilinear sources, so you find some generating function of, of the Prince functions for bilinear, fermion bilinear sources, and then you express the resulting trace log uh, in terms of Wilson loop using the work line formulation, and uh, then you go to large n, you write a joint and anti-symmetric representation of Wilson loops as products of fundamental and or anti-fundamental Wilson loops. For instance, a, a Wilson loop in the adjoint would be equal to the Wilson loop in the fundamental times the Wilson loop in the anti-fundamental plus directions of order 1 over n squared. Use similar formula for the Wilson loop in the, in the anti-symmetric representation. And then, crucial, use symmetry relation between fundamental and anti-fundamental Wilson loops and for their 
connected correlators. For instance, an example would be to take uh, the connected twin function of uh, two Wilson loops, which is shown in this slide, and uh, using large chain factorization and so on, argue that these two things are the same, but you know, if you look at the arrows, you see that they some agree and some do not, and therefore you have to use some uh, charge conjugation symmetry to relate the two. So the conclusion is that the key ingredient to this proof of uh, plenary equivalence is indeed C, is charge conjugation. It is clear from our proof that C invariance is necessary, and uh, uh, this authors, Dr. Nussel and Yaffe, have also argued that it is also sufficient of the equivalents. Uh, then later, uh, Unsal and Yaffe, and also in a previous paper, roughly uh, the same content, Barbon and Hoyos, have shown that actually C is spontaneously broken if the theory is put on a, it's compactified on R3 times S1, and S1 is small enough where you can do some perturbation. And uh, in that case, indeed, planar equivalence does not hold, but actually was never claimed to hold uh, in that case. However, uh, people have done numerical calculations confirming, on one hand, this breaking of C when the uh, radius of S1 is small, but they have also shown that, as expected on some general grounds, like we argued with harmonic shipment, uh, C is restored for large radii, and in particular on R4. And there is also some recent work by this uh, Italian group uh, showing both analytically and numerically that uh, this spontaneous breaking of C is related to a non-vanishing Lorentz breaking fermion number current which circulates in the <coughs> compact direction, in the S1 direction, which is spontaneously generated at small r, but again disappears as uh, r is increased. So I think there is by now some overwhelming evidence that this planar equivalence does work on R4. So uh, this, I think I may come back to it because of lack of time. It's a side remark that we will skip it. So now the idea is to uh, is to see whether we can really make some predictions for what at least for one frame of QCD based on this large N limit. And uh, I want to emphasize a couple of such possible consequences. One is that one frame of QCD should have approximate bosonic parity W. Well, why? Because simply since in super young meals uh, there are chiral multiplets with the scalar and pseudo-scalar and the fermion all degenerate. And since this equivalence only holds in a bosonic sector, we expect that all that is left of this supersymmetric degeneracy is a degeneracy between the scalar and pseudo-scalar in one frame of QCD. Is that crazy? Well, it doesn't look that crazy if we make the following observation. But of course, this has to be now checked numerically. But uh, you can make the following hand-waving argument. For the pseudo-scalar mass in one flavor of QCD, you can use, again, this WB formula. Uh, from the known topological susceptibility in super young meals, which has been measured in the lattice, under the to the fourth, about. Correcting for the fact that you are in one frame instead of square root of six, you get the square root of two. You get the, uh, the pseudo scalar, uh, so the, that, that is the U1 part <coughs> of this uh, one frame of QCD, should weight around 500 MeV. And well, for the scalar, I don't know what to take, but you can argue that perhaps uh, the lighter scalar particle in one frame of QCD is not very different from the, uh, I don't know how it's called these days, the zero meson, which has some pi pi resonance, which is not part <coughs> in mass, if you also think that, of course, the experimental number take 
takes into account the fact that pores do have masses, and this is the massless intuition. But there is actually some recent work by these authors uh, also supporting this approximate degeneracy. So, although this is by far not yet confirmed, I don't think there is any uh, contradiction, certainly. Now, uh, a related property would be the absence of some activity in certain kind of correlators uh, that people can measure on the lattice. In super young means, a well-known word identity tells us that correlation functions of, uh, of chiral operators do not depend on the distance of the coordinates, while, of course, if I take uh, a chiral and anti-chiral, they do. And uh, to the extent that this planar equivalence works at n equals 3, uh, you would expect that uh, this correlator in one plane of the CD are approximately space uh, separation independent, whereas uh, this is not. And uh, of course, the constancy of this one is due to the exact, would be due to the almost, in this case, exact cancellation between the intermediate scalar and pseudo-scalar states, which so cut here and add up here. Now, but perhaps the most striking prediction of this is that you can make an estimate of the core condensate in one plane of QCD just using the exact result for the Luino condensate in uh, super young mills. This is known. work of several authors, the instant on calculations done in some appropriate limit. And uh, now, you have to appreciate the following fact that uh, uh, to go from n equal infinity to n equal 3 is slightly better in this context than the usual large n, which is a real extrapolation, because here we have another point where to pin down the number which is n equal 2. Since at n equal 2, the quarks become color neutral, the condensate should vanish there. And so actually, since n equal 3 happens to be between 2 and infinity, we have a, a, an interpolation. So we try to use all we know uh, about uh, the condensate, for instance, how it scales with some anomalous dimensions and some beta function and uh, the value, the vanishing value is n equals 3, and we end up with this prediction where this k of one-third, <coughs> you know, k of 0 is 1, and k of one-third suffers 1 over n correction, so supposedly uh, uh, it's, it's not very far from, from 1. And uh, so the, the final result can be put in different ways, but for instance, a particularly good one is to write this for a of group invariant condensate in terms of uh, lambda, the standard lambda parameter, one of the standard lambda parameters of the theory. And uh, a recent lattice calculations by the Grand et al. seem to have confirmed even too well to my taste our prediction. I think there are some uncertainties in how we convert uh, lattice numbers into, into MEDs and so on. So I wouldn't take this agreement uh, for really a face value, but certainly, um, certainly it's very encouraging for the prediction. Uh, recently with Grant Shore and the Harmonia and myself, and they attempt to extend this to to uh, more than one flavor, and actually it's related to Elias' uh, point. I mean, how do you try to extend this to more than one flavor? You can try to take the same oriented fold theory with anti-symmetric fermions and act with NF flavors, but now in the fundamental, small NF flavors in the fundamental. Now, if you go to n equals 3, uh, you just have the anti-symmetric flavor plus the fundamental flavors, you just put them all together and you get simply NF plus one fundamental uh, 
triplets of uh, SUC color. And at large N, the, the flavors which are the fundamental are subleading, and therefore the larger limit of this theory uh, looks very much like this, the one of the orientifold theory. Actually, when you look at those beta functions, uh, in some cases they fit the beta functions of super young wheels even better than when you do not have those extra fundamental flavors. But then there are questions of symmetry groups and so on. So you have to be very careful about uh, the dictionary, namely which sectors of one theory are supposed to match the sectors of the other. And uh, we tried to do that and uh, got, got, for instance, a, a condensate for uh, two flavor, so, sorry, three flavor QCD. So we suppose it's very close to nature, three massless flavor QCD, which would be uh, given by this formula. By the way, in, the, in this plot, as in the previous one, this is the uh, this is this formula. It's a relation between the condensate and the coupling constant. Uh, say both normalized at some scale. Say two GeV is conventional. The dotted line represents this thirty percent uncertainty, and the blue rectangle is roughly the experimental range for alpha and for the condensate. So to the extent that the uh, blue rectangle, uh, you see, enters this region, we have agreement. So I think all this is quite encouraging. And uh, so let me conclude on this first part of the talk, which took exactly half an hour. That uh, I think this Sovietical large and expansion is perhaps the first example of large end considerations which lead to quantitative analytic predictions in a non supersymmetric strongly coupled gauge theory in four dimensions. And uh, I want to emphasize that since its proposal, which goes back to 2003, progress has been made actually, as I tried to argue, on the non perturbative proof and also on providing numerical checks. And I know that more is coming the, uh, from the lattice people, uh, the main challenge being that you need to uh, work in unquenched theory and in the chiral limits. So uh, the best thing to do would be to use Ginsberg Wilson fermions and unquenched. And this is still not an easy job, but people are optimistic. Uh, OK, but I think still much more work is needed to estimate one over n corrections or to extend this equivalence in other directions, like trying to connect perhaps uh, theories with different numbers of supersymmetries. So that concludes the first part. And this is uh, uh, the second one, which a priori has nothing to do with the first, but only the only point in common is the original motivation. We wanted to check this planar equivalence and compute its accuracy like one over n projections in a simple quantum mechanical case. And uh, we uh, didn't do that, but with Bosley, we stumbled instead on an, un on an amusing <coughs> model with uh, unexpected properties from the physical point of view and possible implications even in condensed matter physics as well as in some branches of mathematics. So I want to try to amuse you too with those. So it's very simple. Consider the larger limit of the human matrix theory. Now you know that with some qualifications, uh, which I don't want to enter into, the relevant states at large n are given by single trace operators acting on some vacuum state. Now, uh, let's consider, to be very simple, a single, a case of a single bosonic n by n matrix A, which is a boson, A and A dagger, and a single fermionic matrix F. And then this uh, planar Hilbert space is just scanned by single trace of creation operators of bosons and fermions. You see, you have, you, you 
can have N1 bosons followed by N1 fermions followed by N so on and so forth, okay? So this will specify our Hilbert space where uh, zero is the usual empty for vacuum. Uh, provided we take Hamiltonians, which are themselves single trace normal order operators, uh, with the trace, with traces, with n factors being multiplied by some appropriate powers of g, in such a way that you can do your standard top light, uh, light and limit. And as I said, we need some qualification, but the Hamiltonian acting on a single trace state gives to leading order a combination of single trace states. So it leaves you within the single <coughs> trace. And the coefficients uh, or the metric element of the Hamiltonian depend only on the top counting lambda. Uh, this is an example of how you know, this Hamiltonian acting on a state which has four single trace of four operators brings you to, I don't know, a three particle, a three particle state with, a, with an amplitude which is of order lambda to the one half. And then, uh, I don't know how, but we, we got into this very simple uh, case. We took a, a supersymmetric charges of this form. So the supersymmetric charge Q annihilates a fermion and either creates one or two bosons with a relative coupling G. Q square is clearly zero, immediately check. The Hamiltonian is the usual Q, Q dagger. The Hamiltonian commutes with Q, of course, because of the need potency of Q, but also this commutator of Q and Q dagger commutes with, uh, with the Hamiltonian. And actually C squared is equal to H squared, which means I can diagonalize C and its eigenvalues are plus or minus e. And uh, uh, the Hamiltonian will also commute with the fermion number. So I can write down, never mind, the whole Hamiltonian. It consists of a purely bosonic piece and something which is bilinear in the fermions, f of dagger, and that's why the whole Hamiltonian commutes with fermion number. This seems to be a very trivial model, but it has very non trivial properties. Well, first of all, it has a supersymmetric ground state because you see immediately from the normal ordering of this Hamiltonian, the default vacuum is an exact uh, all order eigenstate of this Hamiltonian and has zero energy. However, of course, if this Hamiltonian has, and it does have, no zero energy eigenstates, those must be organized in SUSY doublets. The result that has to have the same uh, value for C, this C times minus 1 to the F. Now, the amusing thing is that the dependence of uh, the spectrum and the properties of this model on the top coupling are highly non trivial. And let me discuss two extreme limits. But of course, the match of the inter interest happens in between these two extreme limits. Now, one limit is quite trivial. Lambda goes to zero. The theory becomes free. Uh, the supersymmetric charge is simply trace fermion times the dagger. And the Hamiltonian is simply trivial. Okay? It just counts the number of bosons plus the number of fermions. So trivial limit. However, we'll see that there are no trivial applications even of this trivial limit. Now, uh, the other interesting case is lambda goes to infinity. You can show rigorously that in that limit you can neglect a dagger. OK, it looks almost obvious, but I mean, you have to really show it rigorously. And therefore, the supersymmetric charge becomes trace f a dagger squared, which means the supersymmetric charge uh, destroys a fermion and replaces it by two bosons. And, well, usually, well, you have to be scared of the Hamiltonian, but otherwise the Hamiltonian takes a very simple form again, uh, because instead of all this junk, you get this simpler, uh, the sum of this purely bosonic term, which is quartic, and this quartic uh, fermion by linear terms plus a fermion number term, which also has to be included. Now, the interesting 
property of this strong coupling for infinite coupling Hamiltonian is that it conserves now B and F separately. A generic lambda, it doesn't happen, but an infinite lambda, the Hamiltonian, or this rescale Hamiltonian, conserves both B. B is the barrier, sorry, B is barrier, is boson number and fermion number separately. So the Hamiltonian splits into blocks that become block diagonal. And then we can ask how does supersymmetry act in these two limits and how is it implemented and finally what happens at more generic values of lambda. And uh, this is the situation for lambda goes to zero. Since supersymmetry um, uh, destroys, sorry, the, in this plot I put on this axis the total number of quanta, fermionic plus bosonic, and on this axis, the fermionic number of quanta. And uh, uh, um, you can easily count how many states you have, uh, and the numbers indicated in each of these uh, places indicates the degeneracy of the state. I told you that in this limit, lambda goes to zero, the Hamiltonian becomes just uh, n, the number of quanta, and therefore there is a lot of degeneracy. Now, uh, how does supersymmetry work? Since supersymmetry destroys one boson and uh, one boson agrees one fermion or vice versa, it conserves n, and therefore it acts vertically, just by one step, either up or down. So what happens is that uh, uh, this Hilbert space should be such to uh, be able to implement a, a good representation of the supersymmetric algebra. And this is not completely trivial. For instance, if you go to the level n equals 6, you see here that while these two guys are nicely partnered of each other, you see one that has fermion number 1, the other has fermion number 0, here uh, the matching is more complicated. So here, uh, these two guys must find partners among these four, but there are two left over which must have partners among these three. There is one more left over which has to have a partner over there. Now, of course, you see from this picture that everybody has partners. I mean, this can be shown. Except, of course, this only bachelor, which is the, uh, uh, the trivial vacuum, which doesn't have any partner. The poor guy, so it must be at zero energy. But everything else is matching. Now let me contrast, we we'll go back to this situation in a moment, but let me contrast this with what happens at lambda equal infinity. At lambda equal infinity, the supersymmetric charges, uh, say, destroys one fermion and creates two bosons, or vice versa. And therefore, in a diagram which, in which I have f plus b and f, they act along uh, lines at 45 degrees. Okay? Because, for instance, you create a, a, a fermion, you destroy two bosons, and therefore you decrease f by 1, and you increase f by 1. So, they are, so in this case, the, the multiples, the supersymmetric multiples, should relate to neighboring states which lie along this 45 diagonal. Now you see, again, of course, the, the trivial vacuum has no partner, because if you move along the diagonal here, you find nothing. But also this guy doesn't have any partner, because there is, there is nothing here. So uh, that means that uh, you really realize that some of, the, of these blocks, I, rem I remind you that in this limit, the Hamiltonian is block diagonal. So, uh, the Hamiltonian only acts within one block here, but uh, among the, the, I mean, this state must have zero energy, this state must have zero energy, here you have two states, but they only have one partner, so one of the two states there must have zero energy and so on. And if you try to look up at this uh, picture, you find, you start to find that in several sectors, in several blocks, there must be some, actually one uh, zero energy bosonic uh, eigenstate. I mean, what I put in this uh, 
in these blue boxes are the sectors in which we should contain one equal zero state. We'll see in a moment the systematics of this zero energy state. But for the moment, it's just a trivial observation that as you move along this diagonal, simply some states don't find the partner, and therefore, by supersymmetry, they must have zero energy. So, I repeat, at lambda much less than 1, it is trivial to solve for the spectrum. And we will see in a moment that this yet has no trivial implications on the combinatorics of what mathematicians call binary networks. At lambda goes to infinity, it's almost the opposite. Mathematical results on the combinatorics of these binary necklaces have implications on the spectrum of the model and on how supersymmetry gets realized. But let me tell you how is the picture emerging. At lambda, very small, there is a perfect matching of bosonic and fermionic states, with the simple exception of the bosonic fork vacuum. So if you compute the Winter index for this model at lambda equals zero or very small, you'll find one because there's just one bosonic zero energy state. But as lambda goes to infinity, there are many other bosonic states that cannot find the partner and therefore uh, they must all have zero energy and therefore necessarily the Witten index must jump somewhere between lambda equals zero and lambda equals infinity. And you can see that these unpaired states, well, first you can see uh, experimentally, and then we also prove it mathematically, that these unpaired states occur at every value of f, of the terminal number. And therefore, you can look for this jump in the width and index in low terminal number sectors, where you can easily do some numerical calculation. To do the numerical calculation, you introduce a cutoff and you diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Now a generic F, you don't have any more blocks. Everything mixes in principle. You have a big matrix, and you diagonalize it numerically after you put a cutoff. Uh, then you try to remove the cutoff, and you see whether the eigenvectors and the eigenstates uh, converge. Now, so let me tell you briefly what are the results of this uh, lowest fermion number sector is a phase transition which happens exactly at lambda equal 1. The weak coupling energy gap, because at zero coupling you have the ground state and then just harmonic oscillator spectrum, uh, the uh, energy gap disappears for all F, for all these effects. The spectrum, however, becomes discrete again as you go on the other side of the transition coupling bigger than one. And uh, furthermore, you find an interesting strong weak coupling type of duality between the spectra um, of the model. But this seems to work only in these two sectors, F equals 0 and 1. Uh, you can also do better. You can actually, in those two sectors, you can actually solve the problem completely analytically in terms of the zeros or some hypergeometric function, you can study this duality, and also how you approach the, the phase transition at lambda equal 1. Um, at lambda bigger than 1, the second uh, zero energy state pops up, and the Witten index jumps by one unit. This was first found numerically, but then we could find out through the analytic form of the second ground state which can be formally written down at all lambda, but of course it's only normalizable at lambda, at big lambda, and becomes non-normalizable at lambda less than one. And when you go to the F equal two sector, which is still a bosonic sector, parameter number two, uh, you get two more equal zero states in agreement with those infinite coupling results. Um, now, it's also interesting how this all works at finite cutoff. The finite cutoff actually breaks supersymmetry explicitly. And what happens is that the super multiplets, as they come from weak coupling into strong coupling, they rearrange themselves. There's a kind of uh, partner swapping mechanism. So uh, I will show you some diagrams. 
But at infinite cutoff, it seems that the whole spectrum collapses to zero, zero, <coughs> and then these new supersymmetric couples or uh, doublets reemerge already, rearrange, remarried from this infinitely degenerate state. So this is shown here. For instance, when the uh, you see when the cutoff, this is the cutoff is equal to 20. Here is 40. Here is 400. You see at 400, you see already the little structure here. All the uh, all the eigenstates go to, to zero. But here, for instance, a uh, uh, cutoff 40, you see very nicely how uh, you see for instance what the bosonic. This is a doublet. The bosonic member of this doublet which is at non-zero energy here, goes to zero energy over there. Its fermionic partner does not go to zero energy, goes up again, and, uh, and, and makes a doublet now with the bosonic uh, state of this weak coupling doublet, and so on and so forth. And here you see how the Witten index jumps. Of course, it jumps uh, in a continuous way at finite cutoff, but you know, in a sharper and sharper way as the cutoff is increased. So there's clearly this, this continuous transition, and you get some similar results uh, when you look at the sectors with fermion number two and three. So you see, for instance, here you find a degeneracy, but some of the states with F equal three do not have partner in F equal two. It means that their partners have fermion number four. So it's a rather complicated structure. Now, what is this connection with uh, necklaces? Well, uh, we constructed and counted these states, uh, which belong to these supersymmetric tablets, and we thought we should look for something similar, known in mathematics. And uh, it naturally comes to mind that this single trace operator with two kinds of particles, a boson and a fermion, to be somehow in correspondence with what mathematicians call binary necklaces, okay? It's quite clear. Uh, so necklaces which are made with two kinds of beads, which mathematicians maybe like to call zeros and ones, and let's say we keep on calling bosons and fermions. And you can look in uh, on the web, there's a nice site which is the encyclopedia of integer sequences, and for instance, you find there is an integer sequence which happens to have this name, I don't know why, and uh, it's, it's indeed the number of uh, binary necklaces with two colors where turning over is not allowed, which simply means in our language that psychic and anti-psychic ordering are kept distinct. And there is a formula, MacMahon's formula, for the number of binary necklaces. But, of course, there is a problem the number of binary necklaces with an even or an odd number of fermions or of ones, say, is in general different. Okay? It's enough to take the case of a necklace with two bits, okay, with two uh, objects. Uh, you see, you have two bosons, boson, boson, fermion, fermion, but you only have one fermion because AF is equal to FA, because they are the same under cyclic transformation. So how can, uh, and in fact, when you look at the number uh, given in this, uh, in this uh, site, and you compare with our numbers of uh, states, they did not match. So how can supersymmetry work if MD is different from MF? It cannot work unless you use the fact that the Pauli exclusion principle kills some of these binary necklaces and gives back the balance between the bosons and the fermions. So in other words, the number of states that we have uh, for a given number of partons is what we could call Pauli allowed necklace. So we need to use some kind of Pauli razor to take out uh, necklaces that are uh, forbidden by the Pauli principle. And this is the situation. Okay, if you have F and B even or odd, so these are the bosons, <coughs> the, 
finite necklaces are a one-to-one -one correspondence with our states, with one exception, in this sector in which we have an even number of fermions and an even number of bosons, some of these necklaces happen to be forbidden by the Pauli exclusion principle, and this is just what gives back a, a, a perfect correspondence between the number of, uh, of bosonic and fermionic states. And these are the formula which give the, all the binary necklaces, the Pauli allowed and the Pauli forbidden necklaces. They, you know, they, they are given by this Mahmoud formula where phi of D is Euler, you see, like, again, hitting on something like Euler in a sense, uh, so-called Tolstoy function, which counts the number of prime numbers and so on. Anyway, there are explicit formulae and uh, everything works, and you see that the difference between the Pauli allowed and the Pauli forbidden is that here, for the Pauli allowed, this D, this D divisor of N has to be off. Now, well, we can even get to some more detailed counting of the number of states. Uh, for instance, we can express the number of Pauli forbidden <coughs> necklaces as a function of the number of bosons and fermions in terms of the total number of, of necklaces for a reduced number of bosons and fermions, where this is the definition of k. Okay, so you divide b by 2 to the k, f by 2 to the k, until f over 2 to the k is odd, and b over 2 to the k is an integer, and, and then those are the number of. The, this formula allow you, in principle, to express all, all uh, binary necklaces in terms of only the power allowed one for which you have this uh, supersymmetry relation. So perhaps there could be of some use in this combinatorics. I want to emphasize that the number of uh, Pauli forbidden necklaces fluctuates a lot. You see in some cases it's zero. In some cases are very, very huge numbers. Um, and there is a, a rather simple mathematical characterization of what is, a, of course, a forbidden necklace. Now, uh, there is actually a formula for the generating function of the allowed, how we allowed necklaces, which we derived actually with the help of Don Fraguet, who is a colleague of mine, not at CDF, but de France. And uh, he was, uh, he's a mathematician, a very famous one. I think some of you may, may know his, his work. So uh, you can actually write a formula which generates, you know, expanding in x and y, powers of x and y, generates the number of Pauli allowed necklaces. It has a simple formula. And out of this formula, you derive uh, interesting Witten-like indices, because you see, for instance, here you sum over uh, boson and fermion states with a factor minus 1 to the f. Then, and uh, so this is the Witten-like formula for fixed B plus F. So this would be the relevant Witten index when you are at weak coupling, whereas here you have the relevant Witten index when you are a strong coupling and supersymmetric acts along those diagonals. You see here what you keep fixed is not the number of bosons plus the number of fermions, but is the number of bosons plus twice the number of fermions. And when you do this using this formula, you find this exact result that this super trace, if you want, is zero except if this n, which is the repeat, the number of bosons plus twice the number of fermions, is either plus or minus one modulus six. Now this is precisely generalizing that those first, now I, I tilted by 90 degrees the previous picture, uh, f is this way and b actually is this way, not b plus f. But you see, previously I had this first uh, uh, few uh, blocks where there had to be a zero mass, a zero energy eigenstate. Now this supertrace formula generalizes 
minus this to all over, I mean, up to infinity. So along, so uh, the, precisely in this, uh, along this staircase, you must find one and only one equal, equal zero plus only eigenstate. So they happen at every even f, because they are all bosons, for b equal f plus or minus one. Okay, so in blocks in which the f is even and b is f plus or minus one, there must be one zero energy eigenstate. We'll see that this is related to a statistical mechanics problem in a moment. Now, these blocks are quite huge. So you see I'm competing with uh, with uh, the big, <laughs> big numbers here. Uh, you see, for and they, they actually the sizes of these blocks are given by Catalan's numbers. Okay, so for instance, in this block there are 280,012 uh, states, and out of this, one must have zero energy. This is the consequence of that counting of powerly allowed necklaces. Now, what is the connection with statistical mechanics? But well, it's quite amusing. It's with the so-called XXZ model. Now, in the XXZ model, you have Pauli matrices at some sites, I equal 1 to n. It's cyclic, n plus 1 is equivalent to 1. And there is an asymmetry parameter called delta. Okay. I think it's called XXY because it's symmetric in X and XXZ because it's symmetric in the first two, and there is an asymmetry in the third entry. Now, uh, we were able to prove the following equivalence between the XXZ chain and the symmetry parameter delta and our infinite coupling Hamilton. So, two statements. If F is odd and B is either even or odd, then the strong coupling Hamiltonian, our strong coupling Hamiltonian, is, well, is minus the Hamiltonian of XXZ at a symmetry parameter one half, plus a number, okay, and it's fixed anyway, plus a number. And if F is even and B is odd, and notice that this includes exactly those uh, boxes where we expect the zero energy eigenstate, because I told you. Those correspond to F even, a boson, and B equal F plus or minus 1. So this is, belongs to this case. In that case, the strong coupling Hamiltonian is, is this one, at a secret parameter minus 1 half plus the quarter of F. And of course, since these are given by the same Hamiltonian, supersymmetry connects also these two different XXZ models, by the way. But the non trivial consequence is that we can now interpret the ground state of this XXZ model at delta equal minus one half as the equal zero state of the supersymmetric field. Okay? Uh, now, this XXZ model at delta equal minus one half was the subject of many, of a lot of work uh, by, started with a paper by Rasmus and Scott. This is not Kandal Sumto. Uh, and for instance, one, they made many, many conjectures, and there is a lot, a large literature on this. And if you go on this uh, front map, you find a lot of work, and also some of our colleagues, like Zuber, has worked on this. Uh, now, for instance, one conjecture is that the ratio of the largest to the smallest component of this ground state eigenvector is the number of alternating sign matrices, which I don't even know exactly what is the definition. But anyway, that number is this is given by this formula. So if n, which is odd, is 2n plus 1, uh, you get this number. And this number is supposed to be, in a, wide, in a quite natural basis, the ratio of the projection of the eigenstate, the largest and the smallest projection of the eigenstate. Now, this number is, uh, is 10 uh, million and something, and uh, uh, if n equal 8 corresponds to n equals 17, which means 
is this block here with 8 and 9. It has, uh, it's a block of 1430 by 1430 size. And in fact, sorry, and in fact, uh, math, I mean, we, we, we solve, we diagonalize the matrix with Mathematica, and this gave this huge number with a 0.1 accuracy. So uh, it is clear that it works. Now the question is whether supersymmetry will help or not proving or understanding this uh, this conjecture. In particular, supersymmetry makes you move along these diagonals and may connect these different sectors where you you where you make the relation to x and z model. And also, as I said already, supersymmetry relates in a non-trivial way spectra of this model with different asymmetry parameters and different number of sides. And uh, all these I'm sure, and all these uh, uh, relations have been uh, verified numerically and they all work. So uh, I'm really basically through, I just mentioned very briefly that there is also another statistical mechanics model which appears to be related to, to our strong coupling limit and this is a Q bosonic gas where Q is the deformation parameter of this, of an algebra of uh, bosonic creation and destruction operators and uh, it holds in the limit Q goes to infinity so the conclusion from the second part is that SUSY has implications about non-trivial combinatorial problems. And on the other hand, combinatorial methods have non-trivial implications of the dynamics of SUSY models. Now, of course, the, aim, the main, this was supposed to be just a warm-up exercise, and the main aim is to uh, extend this approach to realistic or semi-realistic quantum field theories. For instance, we are working now in equal two, actually along uh, very much the lines that Klebanov has been pursuing many years ago with UCD with, uh, uh, you know, uh, N equal two super young mills in D equal two, trying to see whether a string picture emerges out of this, uh, of this, at the right hand limit. And uh, as I said, although for the moment this is mainly an amusing mathematical game, there seems to be already some quite interesting connection to statistical mechanics models. Uh, at infinite lambda, for some reason, again. So the overall conclusions is that uh, <laughs> I wish to my students, collaborators, and friends a happy birthday and, and more years of fun, where N, of course, goes to infinity. <laughs>